few years ago, I built this big chopping survival knife out of a piece of Damascus I bought off of Amazon. And while I love it and it fits my hand perfectly, it is a bit cumbersome for the average person to use. As you can see, it's got a full width and full length tang with four mosaic pins and two hollow pins in case I want to lash this to a stick or something like that. Overall, I love the feel of this knife, but it is a little bulky, so it's time to try another variation. A commercial knife that I absolutely love is this SE4. That's E-S-E-E-4. -E you can buy this knife and it's a wonderful solid platform to use. This is the knife we'll use for inspiration today as we build our knife blank. Our goal is to make something like this, but matching the dimensions of the SE4 using this Raindrop Damascus. Since I live in a rural town in Germany and I don't want to disturb my neighbors, I don't have a power hammer and can't make this myself, so I'm still buying these billets off of Amazon. This knife will also be using mosaic brass pins and you can order long rods of these and cut them to shape in your own shop. These are 8mm pins and I believe I used 9 or 10mm on my previous build, which is why they're a hair larger. I cheated here and just put the knife blank over top of the Damascus and spray painted it to give myself the outline and the approximate pin locations. A handy trick is to use a Dremel and a sanding wheel to carve out the small radiuses before shaping the entire knife. This project gives me a chance to try out my brand new Vivor 82 inch belt sander or grinder with variable speed controller. What I like about this model is that I can adjust it down to also use 72 inch belts which are more prevalent. Our SE inspired knife blank is looking pretty close, but we're having issues drilling through the handle. It turns out that this came pre-hardened, which is why it was so hard to grind in hindsight. So we're going to temper it back using the fire. At this point, my Paragon kiln was still stuck in custom, so I had to improvise in order to bring back that temper. Helpers! 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 <laughs> As you can see, the triplets were pretty excited about the entire process. Once the fire burned down a little bit, we're able to do hot dogs and marshmallows on the coals. Now that we've ruined the hardness of the blade, we can go ahead and drill through it and we had no problem using the same drill bit, same cutting oil. It was clearly a tempering issue that I had. A quick test shows us that the pin fits nicely, very tight in the hold, almost no wiggle room, which is exactly what I want. So we cut the pin down to three pieces, which is just enough to finish this knife and have zero excess. The handle pieces I'm putting on here are called scales. So for the scales, I'm going to be using this piece of oak firewood, which is strange. Most people use much nicer material, but this is kiln dried and it has a moisture content of below 10%, which means it's going to have minimal shrinkage once I glue it onto the knife. I'm also not a big fan of running to the store every time I need something. This was available to me and it turned out to be a pretty nice piece of local oak. So I'll always have a little bit of Germany with me, even when I move back to the States. I apologize for the change in backgrounds here. You'll see a couple of different work surfaces being used because this video is spread out over the course of several days while I was waiting for the kiln to come in. I worked on a few other backgrounds. Now the trick with drilling your handle scales is to have the handle scales slightly larger than the blank. So you sand it back to the metal and each time you drill a hole, throw the pin in immediately so you don't lose that location. If you do this for all three pins, you'll have it line up absolutely perfectly. Then you can drill through to the other side and have both sides match up. If you're building your knife and you get to this point and your handle looks like garbage, that's totally normal. This is rough cut wood larger than it should be and it takes significant sanding to get it down to something that looks actually presentable. I've already taken a couple passes at the belt sander with this so that it doesn't look as messy, but we still need to trim it down quite a bit to get it down to that handle size. I will not be beveling the spine of this blade because I like to have a little bit more strength in the tip even at the expense of being a little heavier. 30 minutes on the grinder later, I have the blade belly and bevel set which of course takes off the Damascus appearance. Even though this is still Damascus steel, the acid etch is no longer showing the differences between the 15 and 20 and the 1095 steel that this is made of. The way modern pattern Damascus or pattern welded steel works is that you're exposing the layers between the two pieces of metal using a little bit of ferric chloric acid. The 15N20 steel resists the etch while the 1095 gets eaten away a little bit, showing you the pattern that already exists but is not visible to the naked eye. When you put these side by side, you can see that I made a thicker handle on the Damascus knife. 
I think that the SE4 knife handle is just a little bit too thin. Finally, my 24 inch Paragon kiln has arrived and we heated this up to 1500 degrees Fahrenheit, let it soak for an hour before quenching it in some oil. It's important to keep the knife moving at this point so it doesn't create an air envelope around itself and protect itself from the cooling process that we want to take place. Of course, we used the kiln again to temper it back, but since it doesn't get red hot during the tempering process, it wasn't as fun to watch. I'm not using argon in my kiln, so I do develop a little bit of oxidation through this process, which means that I have forged scale that needs to be sanded off prior to the etch. I find that screwing the knife directly to a 2x4 allows you to screw the 2x4 down to your work surface and have a beautiful platform from which to sand from. You may also notice that I finished my filming backdrop. After making 100 videos, I finally have something that looks professional and advertises the channel in case someone steals my content. The trick with hand sanding is to work your way up to 800 grit all in one direction with a piece of wood backing the sandpaper so that all your scratch marks go in the same direction and are parallel with each other. Wipe the blade down with acetone to get off any oils. Oils will resist the acid and you'll have fingerprints all over the blade if you don't do this step. And then we drop it into the 40% ferric chloric acid. And we let it sit for about 45 minutes to an hour. Make sure you use Windex or ammonia to neutralize that acid when you pull it out. I did that over in the sink and not on my beautiful, nice, brand new backdrop. I do love the way that raindrop turned out, so now it's time to finally glue up the handle permanently instead of doing all this dry fit nonsense that I've been doing for the last few days. I like to use way too much epoxy because it's a lot easier to wipe it off the outside than it is to add more to the inside. I didn't film the clamping process, but the bottom line is you throw two clamps on between the pins because if you throw them on the pins, they're just going to put pressure on the brass and not on the handle itself. I recently learned that if you clamp too hard with thousands of pounds of pressure, you can actually squeeze out the glue completely and you get less of a bonding surface. So we want to clamp with medium to hard, but not too hard pressure. I wish I could be more specific, but I don't know the numbers. I use the Dremel again to clean up those inside radiuses just because it fits it so nicely after forming them. And then I'm going to tape the blade up to protect it while I hand sand the handle. I typically use gaffers or painter's tape for the blade, but I didn't find any in my garage and once again used what I had, which was Gorilla Tape. I was afraid this would lead some sort of residue. I'd have to work off of the blade, but it came off fairly nicely. I didn't find any glue uh, left over. It's probably because I only had it on there for an hour or two while I worked the handle. I like doing this to protect that Damascus etch because you can sand it off again and you'd have to re-etch again. With the handle completed and the blade nearly completed, I do one final comparison. And while I didn't perfectly match the SE4, I'm pretty happy with my result. Since my bevel was already set during the construction process, I only need to sharpen the very edge of this with my whetstone. To sharpen means to remove material, and to hone means to line up that bevel perfectly using something like a steel or a leather strop. There's thousands of ways to sharpen, I just like using the whetstone. I always test the knife on the material it's meant to cut. So here you see me cutting into some nice pine, taking off big pieces, and also working on some feather stick techniques to make sure it cuts the material I'm intending it to cut. I do end up getting carried away here though because it cuts so beautifully and I'm having a lot of fun. In the end, I'm extremely happy with the way this came together. The blade handle is almost flawless. There's no gap between the scales and the actual tang. I was able to get a fairly high polish on that oak even though it was just firewood. And while some of the pins had some defects in them from the beginning, they still look really nice all put together. I really like the way that the grays came out in that handle to tie the color scheme in with the blade with a nice deep etch on that raindrop Damascus and a beautiful edge profile throughout. If you've made it this far, consider hitting that subscribe button before moving on.